Hello, good afternoon everyone and you're very welcome to this land use community and enterprise workshop. I believe we've over 250 or sorry 120 registered and online maybe maybe closer to 200 at this stage so thank you all for tuning in. I hope that over the next two hours you will hear some really useful information, especially if you are interested in accessing some of the state-owned land in Leash, Offaly and Westmeath for your project or initiative. And by that I mean land owned by Borden Mona, Quilcha or the ESB. So we will hear shortly from Amanda Walsh of Borden Mona. She will be followed by Ger Buckley from Quilcha, and then we will hear from Donald Phelan from the ESB. After that, it will be time for Derek Dolan from Falcha, Ireland, and finally from Orla Martin of Offaly LEO. They will present one after the other for about 10 or 12 minutes each. So these are the areas we will be talking about today, the counties of Leash, Offaly and Westmead. In them, as you will know, much land is owned by Bordnamona, Quilcha, and to a lesser extent, the ESB. Of course, many of us spend time in some of these places already and will be very familiar to us. We've probably all walked in Quilcha woods and perhaps some of us have enjoyed days out in Loch Bora. But what if we want to take the initiative in some of these areas? What if we perhaps want to run a festival, develop a tourist trail, set up a forestry activity camp, or maybe even open a coffee shop. What do we do? I know there are so many creative ideas out there because you have come to me with them. And I think with the, what the main question that comes up is, you know, where do we go? What do we do? How do we access the land? And, and who can we find the information out from? So I think this is what today is all about. It's about helping you decide just that. So let's get started. The first company we are going to hear from is Board Namona. As I'm sure you know, Board Namona has very much changed its focus recently. It has stopped peat harvesting and is now concentrating on climate solutions, renewable energy, recycling and bog restoration. But it's what is happening and what is possible from your point of view in tandem with restoration and rehabilitation that we want to look at today. The company says on its website that rehabilitating bogs creates space for biodiversity, renewable energy and of course public enjoyment. We have already seen some areas being used for this. I myself um, established the park run at Mount Lucas Wind Farm so I know many of the issues that come up and the questions that arise and I hope many of you will get the chance to enjoy a coffee or a bite to eat in the new organic kitchen cafe in Loch Bora Discovery Park. But what if your club wants to organise a run or develop a pitch? What if you want to run an event or a festival? What if you want to start a business based in or around the bogs? What do you need to know and what do you need to do? Amanda Walsh is the Board of Mona Land Use Programme Manager. In that role, she is responsible for the coordination, management and delivery of projects, programmes and land and property development initiatives. She is the person who will be designing and implementing a screening process for the future land use by communities, individuals and groups. So she is very much the person who is the right one for us to hear from today. So over to you, Amanda. Good afternoon, all. Thank you, Pippa. I hope everybody can see my screen. Um, uh, thank you again. This is Tiny from Borden Mona's perspective. I would like to say just in consideration, taking into consideration where Borden Mona is um, today as a company and I'll take you through that in our slides as we go through it. The very first slide that I would like to bring you through is our amenity and I guess we're all very familiar with the groups that are involved in, 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 in developing and progressing amenity but Board Mona is involved and has engaged in the past and into the future with these groups. I think the purpose of this is to show that we have engagement obviously from the community groups which is yourselves here today we also are approached by the national regional groups. Uh, we are in partnership with local authorities on existing and proposed uh, amenities. And there's also our strategic projects. So we do have our internal mandated projects, which have an overlap with our community and local authority and national, national groups. And it's important to point that out. And that's specifically our peatland climate action scheme and our renewable energy projects, which I'll, I'll, I'll explain later on in the slides. But I guess the key thing here is to stand back and look at the fact that collaboration is hugely important to us. 
Uh, we've collaborated with these groups in the past, we'll continue to do so. And I think it's very important for community groups also to ensure that they collaborate. We have seen um, in the past that I guess where collaboration exists, there's traction in the projects. Um, and that's demonstrated through even in County Longford with the Lanesborough to Clondra and Tipperary in, in Littleton. Uh, the other point about this slide really is to confirm and give you some idea of the, the numbers of amenities coming through uh, to us in Borden Mona. So in the past 20 years, we've had circa 30 existing amenities that, that are in varying size in nature and geographical spread across our land bank. And that's in the last 20 years. And we now have circa 30 new proposed uh, community amenities. That's community alone. The previous 30 were where it exists across all of the groups that you see there. And we have seen them increase in size. Um, so the scope of the projects are actually increasing in, in size. And I think really what we want to demonstrate here is that there's been a, a very fast uh, exit out of our peat, peat harvesting announced in January of this year. Mm -hmm. We're moving, we have been in the immunity space and immunity is one of our strategies in our land use programme, which is fantastic and it's, it's great to see it. But we need to be very measured and very planned in our way and how we're going to actually uh, progress with, with the amenity. We need to ensure connectivity. And I guess just to show the, that, that we have had an increase in requests, we've devised a new process. Myself, Joe Ryan is also on the call today uh, to address this and we've collaborated and put processes in place to address this. I'm going to quickly bring you into our screening process, um, which is why you're all here today, to see how can you uh, make contact with Board Namona, what are the processes, what's going on behind the scenes in that screening process and where do you go to from there? So very quickly, step one, it's simple, follow and complete a, a prequel questionnaire. Uh, however, there are some mandatory elements to it and I'll bring you through that on the next slide and I'll give you some details on it. Our information, our email address, obviously land use info, I'm going to mention it a number of times throughout so you don't forget it. That's how you'll contact us. It is monitored on a daily basis. Uh, myself and Joe also have access as do a number of the team members and your requests and queries can come through there. After step one, we're going to take your questionnaire and we're going to review your, 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 your ideas. Um, the idea is to fill out as much information as possible in that questionnaire. I'll go through that later. If you want to look at the possible outcomes, there are four. Working backwards up from the bottom, um, those that are not aligned with our climate solution strategy, unfortunately goes to process end. And again, in a later slide, I'm going to explain what that means to you as a community group. How do you align with our climate solutions uh, strategies? No, not at this time will mean that our probably internal projects such as PCAS, renewables and other reasons for uses for the land because it is still operational. There might be a, a possibility for you to actually carry it out at this time, but it could be in the future. We may, may not be able to give you a time frame for it, but it could be positive for a future development. And then I guess as we get to the top, there is um, the maybe the idea has some merit. We're going to move you on to the next step in this pre uh, screening process. process. Uh, and then if it's not possible in this location, we will actually do some groundwork and we'll come take the initiative to come back to you with a, an, an alternative location that could suit you. Um, as you move through then to step two on these top two options, you're going to have to provide us with uh, financial costs and finance and funding uh, to show that you can actually bring this project through to completion and for monitoring and maintenance post uh, deployment. We will plan a site visit with you. If the site that is, if the alternative site that, you, that we proposed to you is, is agreeable also, we'll proceed to step two, we'll get the details off you. Sometimes it works out that the alternative site is just not going to be suitable for the group and that will bring you to the, to the end of the process. The step two outcomes here for those where the idea has merit and it's ticked the boxes in terms of the costs and the funding, we will then bring you through to uh, the internal stakeholder engagement for land use uh, process approvals. So just to be mindful, this is the screening process. We will have to bring this through a stage gated process internally in board in a moment to ensure that the senior level management teams, uh, the stakeholders have an opportunity to review and uh, approve the process. Please bear in mind that we do engage with these people also at this screening process to get feedback. I'm going to bring you through to the next slide, which is what do you need to provide as a community group? Again, this information is available. We can send you a document with it all listed on. You can query us if there's further questions on it. 
the name of the group, the applicant status, whether it's a limited liability company, a registered business or not for profit, um, the description of the project, all the documentation that you have, maps, what's the proposal, what does it involve? Is there planning permission required? Do you need to carry out a feasibility assessment, an AA screening or EIA? Um, and what's the long-term maintenance and sustainability of the, of the, the, the project? Who will use the facility? Um, what uh, can the group meet the insurance requirements uh, required of, of Board and Mona and can you comply with your legal and licensing requirements? Similarly, health and safety reports, very important, uh, list any of the potential safety issues that you might see around the site. Is there issues around access to the site or dangerous uh, river crossings, etc. As we said in the in the in the diagram previous, there's a step two, and we will ask for your your business case, your benefits, your costs, and your funding. I would like to out of this list here, there is a certain amount that's that's very important and should be it's 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 all mandatory. But these particular ones, please hone in on. Um, the insurance requirements are particularly important. Bullet point number three there. Board Nimona must be indemnified by uh, the employer's liabilities uh, policies. If it's a lease being granted, the applicant uh, must be a limited liability company. If it's a license that's being granted, the requirement is that the applicant uh, can be a club or a limited liability company. Now, I would like to point out that Board and Mona's preference would be that it's a license, but it can be, depending on the circumstances of the proposal coming through, a lease might suit better. But our preference is a license, so therefore, if it is to owners for a community group, then a license might suit. Um, funding, management and maintenance, um, if there's no clear resources uh, in place for the proposal, then it's, it's just, it's simply not going to get advanced. Um, just in terms of amenity, we know the, the work that's involved, you as a community group, you understand the work that's required, it can't be underestimated. Um, amenities, I guess you need to demonstrate that the long-term commitment to the project is there and that there's long-term resources available to carry that out to completion and further into to maintenance and management. Um, we must align to the climate solution strategy. I alluded there in, in the process again. What we're saying here, number one, is obviously uh, we have to deliver our PCAS renewables project. They're a precursor to all amenity. Um, and the second item there in terms of the aligning your proposal, any immunity proposal come through with the climate solutions is, I guess, to explain it in terms of, we are obviously very singular in our focus towards the climate solutions strategy. And what we don't want to be doing is handing over lands that don't meet these objectives. Um, and therefore, when you're coming to us with a, a request, think about slow tourism, education, biodiversity, wellness. I mean, it's, it's you know, we're not going to have um, a, a monster truck rallies across the bogs. It's, 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 you've got to think about it in terms of that slow tourism uh, aspect. The next item, I thought it was useful to put up a couple of um, statistics around our land. Uh, Joe's here, will be all too familiar with the, uh, the 80,000 hectares that uh, Board Namona uh, owns. And of that 80,000 hectares, there's 36,000 hectares in Leash, Offaly and West Mead. Uh, the boundary extends to 2,900 kilometres. We have various different land classifications uh, from DP to cut over, cut away, and various uses as a result of those classifications. Um, remote location, we're pretty much remote, as we all know, and we're bound by IPC licences. Um, another important, uh, I suppose, statistics on this is that we do have the rail network, which you're familiar with and very useful for amenity. There's 570 kilometres of rail lines, 72 bridges, uh, 52 underpasses and 96 level crossings. Um, but the key point here really is to hone in on the fact that these, this infrastructure is still in use. It's still operational and we, we, need, we need it for, for our projects. So we have to bear in mind that these projects need to be completed before they can be progressed on for, for, for future use. Um, just to recap on, on my last slide, I know I've only got 10 minutes, so it's just I've hit on some of the points here, but really it is just to kind of hone back on where Board Namona has been and come to. We are Obviously, we've gone through profound change. Uh, we're now sitting firmly as a climate solutions company. And our new focus is on the three pillars, which is our renewables, our rehabilitation and recycling, or three R's as we call them. 
Um, amenity is part of our vision for the future. Um, in all cases, the company really wants to ensure that connectivity piece um, and that's, that, that that's achieved throughout our estate. Um, internally, we've gone through a restructure um, and we have put in place processes, as you've seen outlined um, in the previous slides, to manage the, this uh, amenity, these amenity requests that are coming through. Um, I would like to mention again that our future climate action projects. It is important to point out that while PCAS and renewables are a precursor to amenity, um, particularly let's focus on the peak and climate action scheme, while it won't deliver amenity projects per se, it is going to transform the land. It's going to, we've seen what, what Loch Bora and those places look like after rehabilitation has uh, taken hold. And after a few years, you see the beauty. And that's really what we're, you know, the, the, the climate action scheme, it will obviously deliver that potential for amenity in the future. Um, with renewable energy developments, well, we know that as part of renewable, renewable energy developments, amenity comes with that. It's important to point out that one wind farm alone uh, will send from 15 to 20 kilometres of tracks. Um, only 4% of the actual infrastructure in wind, far, uh, wind farm I should say if the infrastructure only takes up 4% of a wind farm and the rest is rehabilitated. So again, I guess nobody really wants to walk on a bog as it stands today where the drains are blocked and nothing is growing. But as we adopt these projects and move them forward and align ourselves with our climate solution strategy, we're going to see hundreds of, you know, thousands of hectares of land being transformed as a result of these projects and plus immunity then come after. Um, I guess it's important to note as well with the renewable energy projects, co-location uh, is has been seen and evidenced and been very successful, particularly in our Mount Lucas wind farm, and that thereby provides enhanced economic benefits to the communities and surrounding communities. Um, I think uh, that, in terms of um, time constraints, obviously just to reiterate, we are going through an internal process. PCAS and renewables has to happen first and that sometimes will have an implication in terms of maybe your projects because we've got to get these projects advanced in such a way then that we can have a look at the, the potential for amenity projects in those areas. Um, that's really sums up my presentation for today. I think really the summary of the key points of the screening process are to be uh, familiarise yourselves again with the mandatory requirements that we listed out there, provide as much information as possible possible when you're submitting it to the land use info email address. Myself and Joe are on that. We're available for questions later on and thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much Amanda. Um, really interesting information there. The questions are coming in already and as Amanda she said she will be joined by her colleague Joe Ryan for the Q&A session later. But in the meantime I want to move on to our next company and it's this one. We all know Quilch's forests. They are open to the public and chances are we have all been in them, enjoying rightly what they call Ireland's biggest outdoor playground. But while we might see things like this going on, do we really know just exactly how to get there? How do we access it and how do we do it? Quilch is clearly happy to welcome people we can see that from this slide that as well as forests for nature, for climate and for wood, they actually include forests for people and communities in the objectives they are setting out to balance. But in practical terms, to tell us what that actually means, I'm going to pass over now to Quilcha Area Manager, Ger Butley. Thank you much, Pippa, uh, for that introduction. Yeah, look, as you said, um, rightly, I'm the, the Business Area Manager for Quilcha for, for 10 counties. Um, Midlands area, Leash Offley, Westmead included in that. So I suppose, to, as you said, um, we welcome people. I suppose you, you've seen there in the in your opening slide from Pippa that um, you know we've we've multi objectives as a company. We're balancing wood, climate, nature, but today specifically talking about people and communities. So I suppose just maybe to demystify or clarify some points. Um, hopefully, the next ten minutes of our presentation will uh, will do that. Um, so I suppose, first of all, you know, do Quilcher facilitate public access on our forests? And, and I think, look, that's a resounding yes. So that for, for everybody, I think that's the first positive to take away. Um, however, look, there are restrictions. 
Uh, we have an open fires policy. People will often hear this and actually wonder what it is. So essentially, our open fires policy is that we welcome everybody on foot as an individual, as a family basis. You know, that's that sort of a size of small groups, people out walking, people out for a run. Uh, you know, they typically come use the forest at their own leisure. And there's no, um, there's no stopping the use of that forest unless uh, it's for operational reasons, reasons that there's either uh, re-establishment of a forest, harvesting, estates work ongoing. But other than that, it's open for your enjoyment. However, outside of that smaller group, families, individuals, you will need a permit to use our forests. But um, that said, we would hope that going through these slides today, we'll be able to clarify that that's not as big a process as what people uh, might consider it is. I suppose to clarify one other point, leave no trace. Uh, look, what exactly is leave no trace? I suppose it's a, it's a set of guidelines or principles that people have signed up to that, um, you know, when you go use the forest, you'll respect the forest, you'll respect the other users within the forest. Um, you know, you won't have, um, you won't create a risk to others by you being there. Uh, the lighting of fires, the uncontrolled risk that that, that brings. I suppose ultimately, look, we want people to enjoy the forest. Uh, I suppose visit a forest in a condition that you would like to find it and leave the forest in the same condition when you finish up for the enjoyment of the, of the next group. And if everybody did that, it would be would be a brilliant place. And um, I suppose moving on more specifically into the permits, you know, who typically looks for permits off Quilcha? So as I mentioned, there's individuals for personal use, there's individuals for a business usage, uh, you have schools which heavily use the forest, you have groups then moving into groups that are, are a business group or a community group, and then there's local authorities. Um, one thing I just to mention for anyone, the, the website address that's on the bottom of the page here, I've that on the bottom of every slide, that will bring you directly to the Quilcher website where a lot of the information you're getting here today will be there for you. And that should be a, a port of call for you to, to start from. So just moving on, um, in terms of permit types, in terms of, terms of permit types within our forest. So this isn't by any way a, a, a full confirmed list. There are loads outside it, but you'll see from this, I think that, you know, you have everything from the walking group type permits on one end of the scale to, I suppose, car rallying on an organized uh, event on the other end of the scale. So it's kind of everything in between that. Um, what I would say is we're very open to Similar to Amanda, we're very open to taking in the request through our website and it then being um, reviewed and understood for the level of what it offers the, the community, the people, what risk it is to the forest, what risk it is to other users. But I think everyone will probably agree from that list, it's, it's quite uh, expansive. Uh, and therefore, look, what I would say is that I, I think everybody's idea is welcomed and we'll go through a few of them later in the later slides. In terms of permit numbers, um, just out of interest, uh, we, we just pulled the permit numbers. We didn't use 2020 because, for a simple reason, 2020, as we all know, was a bit of a, an unusual year. You know, we experienced very heavy usage of the forests, uh, not hugely, maybe more heavy usage in terms of the individuals or the family going for a walk within their 5K, out for mental health awareness, all that side. Um, we may not have generated massive permit numbers because, you know, a lot of that would have been a non-permitted activity. So this table here is just a, a broad outline of 2019. And you'll see across all of the counties, the 10 that are there are the area that uh, myself and Connor, who's on the call here, manage. Um, and I suppose, look, specifically to this call, you'll see the first three, Lee Shoffley, Westmead, actually carry a very large amount of permits. So I think that's good news that this area is already... Um, this area is already quite heavily used and active and has quite a lot of engagement. But a walkthrough. So to go through in over the next three or four slides, hopefully, hopefully this will fit, you know, your scenario. You obviously, as I said, there's so many types and scenarios, it's hard to fit them all. But we've broken them down. Hopefully you find it useful. Um, school walks. So I suppose, look, school walks, absolutely, as a company, we recognise you know, how important it is to allow young people to interact and gain respect of nature and the outdoor environment, you know, while also understanding the importance of wood to our, you know, to our own lives. Um, 
it's, it's only by doing this that uh, we build up the appreciation of of the environment, the appreciation of being in the outdoors, the, the recognition of dumping and those kind of activities and, and, and instilling how we do not want this to continue. Um, so in terms of school walk, there's insurance 6.5 million uh, is a standard uh, indemnity. Um, again, that's straightforward. Generally, the schools can confirm by email that they carry uh, a school insurance policy that covers them for the outdoor field events that that they generally are all on a platform on. There's no fee attached in a school walk um, because of the above mentioned uh, educational side. Uh, we look for a school health and safety plan and a risk assessment. That's generally not onerous to a school. They're well used to, I suppose they're well used to being out and about and going on visits. Um, so again, that's just a requirement, but not onerous. In terms of notice, again, look, the guys are our own foresters and managers are multitasking. So you know, they're not just waiting for these to come in and maybe to turn them around. So we would we would ask or we would request or respect to get three weeks notice gives us a chance to turn around. Uh, we would request that there's a formal request through the portal. Again, the website's at the bottom that directs people through it. Uh, the, that formal portal uh, will allow our managers to review it, I suppose, at a time that suits the manager, as opposed to getting phone calls when they're on the road and then the school thinks they've done their bit and the manager, to be fair, gets sidetracked and it just gets dropped. So we would just request that they would come through the portal and be requested, albeit, as I said, because of the local nature of school walks, it's usually um, a lot of the time they do come through foresters who, you know, know the school or are locals to the school. So look, that's the school walk. Uh, the next one is, you know, you're thinking of setting up a business within the forest. You know, again, this can relate to an individual or a company. Um, I've just put down a couple of them. Again, big long list here, but you know, the coffee shop, as Pippa uh, mentioned, the Christmas tree depot, outdoor fitness classes, you know, there, there's varying levels of what they are. Um, again, the insurance at 6.5 million indemnity is a requirement, the health and safety plan and the risk assessment. And I have for most activities because, you know, uh, a risk assessment for a coffee shop uh, could be quite different than a risk assessment for a Christmas tree depot, which may have um, Christmas tree netters or chainsaw areas needing to be cordoned off. So again, we just ask people to work on that and, and they'll understand their business. And that, that's what we expect to see when, when they come in for review. We need to see that what you're requesting does not put us at any more of a risk or doesn't put you at any more of a risk. Uh, the permit fee, again, look, it's it depends on the activity, depends on the site location, the market interest. What I would say is our, our website will give a good guideline to anybody interested. Again, that's the address at the bottom. It'll give you a broad idea. There's, there's rates and uh, permit fees on that website. But again, it, it will come down to a local discussion, um, you know, because we have to balance what the risk is to what the reward is. Um, um, again, in, ten, in terms of tendering, um, you know, what I've said there is, you know, we use other items in, when, when we tender and we may not always tender the initial offering. Coffee shop's a good example. Um, you know, somebody had, it's a chicken and an egg. Someone has to come with an idea that nobody has come with before. We may like the idea, run with it. We may do a short term permit, which I suppose puts it in the shop window. That in in return, to be fair, that will generate other people say, geez, I wouldn't mind having a coffee shop. And that may mean that after a three month or a six month permit, we will go to the market for fairness. Uh, and I think people will appreciate that. And it gives everyone that, that fairness at that point. However, if we do take it to the market, what is, and I suppose I want to record here is that, you know, it's not all about the price. Uh, you know, it's the service that's being provided. It's the public fit of that offering to the locality. It's the environmental management that's behind the tender that comes in or behind the, the business. So look, again, that's another element we will we will look at. And um, what I'd say in this is our estates team, Connor, who's on the call here, leads them, the estates foresters, they will review all the requests that come in. They will consider them. They will consider them with all the above aforementioned and it's at that point we'll make a decision. Um, example being, 
you know, an archery permit com comes in in a forest two kilometres on the edge of a town, may we may be happy with the archery permit, but we may actually revert to the person and say, look, the forest doesn't fit the offering because there's too many people walking. However, there's a forest four miles the other side of town that isn't a recreational forest, and we're quite happy to facilitate the archery there. So we'll work with people, but you know they need to work with us too. What I'd say in that, look, in these ones, we're looking for a guideline of three months notice. The next group, I suppose, is, is more around setting up an organised event. Sorry, I'll just take a drink for a second. Setting up an organised event. So I suppose, again, it can be an individual or a company, but in this category, they're the likes of the organised triathlons, the organised mountain bike events, you know, organised walks, larger charity walk events or pony trekking. Uh, probably into a slightly different league, attracting more people, etc. But again, insurance is the same. We still look for health and safety and a site risk assessment. But in this case, we will look for an, an event emergency plan. You take the triathlon. Typically, the event emergency plan will be, you know, you're going to run a, a big event on a Sunday in the sleigh blooms. We are going to need to know your access points, your, your egress, your access, uh, where your civil defence, if you're using them, are going to be. Is there guardy needed from a traffic control? It's that level. And look, God forbid, if it's triathlons or mountain biking, someone gets injured, you need to know where uh, an ambulance can enter or a helicopter can land. It's as simple as that. And that's why you're into a level of needing an emergency plan. A permit fee, again, will, will be uh, attached to this. And again, it will depend on the activity itself. Obviously, the expected audience, if it's a run with 500 people, etc. Uh, the benefits to the local area, again, uh, the likes of a triathlon event in Kennedy, for example, it may provide accommodation to the, to the catchment around that. And that's a benefit to them, which we will recognise, because in turn, that generates goodwill to Quilche in the roundabout forest industry way. So, um, look, I suppose in terms of this category, again, the estates team will review them and they will consider the requests and it'll be similar to the, the previous slide. We would probably look for a six month advance notice in this period. Again, you're getting into more agencies, more time needed, and again, to not miss the event, etc. You know, six months, we would say is a minimum. Typically people coming with these events would be coming to us a year ahead and working through it. And there's over and back and there's, everybody's happy at the end and it works through. I suppose the last group, and it could be a good number of people maybe on the call today, is community groups who, I suppose, look for a funding for a walk. Um, probably, probably have increased, uh, you know, the, the, the group of people. To be fair, we've got a lot of brilliant communities in, in our VAU. We've a lot of brilliant communities in the, the three counties mentioned today. All eager beavers, all wanting to get involved. But, and it's not a negative community spirit often oversteps uh, having things in due process or in order. Like you can end up with 40 people suddenly in a forest uh, wanting to put up signs for an evening or wanting to cut back footpaths. So, you know, it's to manage that. But what I would say is here, we have Connor and his team, they've worked, we've worked in groups in each of the local authorities. Um, the community groups in this instance uh, they need to go back onto the website, the, the address at the bottom. It will direct you to a trail request form. Uh, I just took a screenshot. The, the questionnaire, the, the word highlighted in yellow, if you can see it, uh, will, will link you into a six or a seven page document. Because you're looking to put a walk on the forest, uh, you know, it's an extra on our estate. We, that's why the, the process of seven, eight page per, um, request gets you thinking about what gives us all the information required and gives us a better place to make a decision. In this instance, what's slightly different is, you know, our recreation and the state's team will review this request. It's not just the estates team. Uh, our recreation team need to be involved in this. And I suppose people may wonder, they will get back and discuss with the local authority or the community group. Example is sometimes we might think a walk's a great idea, so might the recreation team, but the local authority, and we all know the likes of Glen Barrow, how hugely successful that is, but it's created, it, it's nearly a victim of its own success now in that it's created a local authority parking issue. So they need to be involved. We respect that. 
but um, and we will discuss with all the parties. Um, what we would say in this, there's no set time limit to complete this. It's usually driven by complexity. Um, you know, these things, these, these, these could take 12 months, they could take two years to go through, and there's probably ones that I'm sure are ongoing for a number of years, four or five years over different steps, and depending on different funding models. All the info is on our website. There's a frequently asked questions section on our Quilter website. Uh, it will probably answer a good number. It won't answer everything, but it'll answer a good number. That may solve your problem. If not, anyway, the next uh, link below, and, and hopefully these can be shared after, will allow you to go straight into our permits page to log your permit, to log your trail, etc. And there is the Recreation at Quilche, um email. And at the bottom for general inquiries, there's an info at quilsha.ie. What I would say is the forests, that's the mountain bike trail in the Slee Blooms. They are absolutely to be enjoyed by people. Um, it's a block of Sitka Spruce, 1935, uh, with the mountain bike trail weaving through it. Um, it's also my backdrop. Um, secondly, you know, water. We've, we've massive appreciation for water quality, water protection. And, uh, you know, everything we do, we're trying to manage that. So you have another area in the Slee Blooms and then you have a, a waterfall over in Offaly. Um, just to go back to summarise then at the outset, we've got the five balancing pillars. Pippa mentioned the three of them and the people and community was this. But, you know, on a, on a daily, you know, we're, we're, that's what we have to try and manage. Our staff manage multiple or multifaceted job roles every day. So they need, the, the quicker you have information or the, the further ahead you provide the information, the longer we can review it, get back to you, and everyone can comfortably work through it. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ger. Um, lots of information there. And Ger will be joined by Quilchia Estates Manager Connor English for the Q&A session later. So look, keep those questions coming in. And so now to the last of our landowners, the ESB. We all know the ESB has closed its two fire, peat fired electricity generation plants in the Midlands at Shannon Bridge and Lanesborough. In light of their planned closure, the company said it would make a contribution of €5 million Euro to the Just Transition Fund. But is there any other scope for engaging with the public? Or with people who feel they could do something with their lands? Donald Phelan of the ESB is here to tell us and he will have a short presentation now. Over to you, Donald. Wonderful. Okay, so look, I have a very short presentation. I suppose it's fair to say that the history of ESB in the Midlands uh, goes back a long way, it goes back at least 70 years, and I'm not going to cover any of that here today. I'm really only looking forward to the future, but an, an important aspect maybe of our history and an understanding of our place in these discussions is that a power plant is an industrial complex, it's an industrial process, and it doesn't uh, inherently have the kind of amenity values that you're going to see in uh, the presentations that were given uh, today by uh, my uh, uh, colleagues in, in uh, Quilte and, and um, Bordemona. What we have been doing is providing energy for the Midlands and for the country. And uh, our intention had been to continue doing that. That got um, put aside by the uh, board Planola. We have spent a significant period of time considering what could we use the sites for. And I'm going to talk to you about what the intended use of the sites is and, and why it is the way it is. So the first thing to say to you is, what can we not use the sites for? The board to a decision effectively means you cannot use the sites to transport fuel in for any kind of processing. And I won't go into the details of the ruling, but um, the, the ruling uh, in terms of the, the biomass power stations that were proposed contained a number of clauses and among them was one that effectively meant that the Bortanola considered it to be inappropriate to be transporting fuels to the stations. And that's something we can't overlook and we can't pretend it's not there. That's considered uh, by the planning specialists in the country to be bad planning. We have to respect that. Another aspect is that we had been using the River Shannon uh, as a source of cooling water and we've been doing that I suppose for 70 years. But changes in legislation around the Water Framework Directive meant that in complying with those changes, we found that the river is less and less capable of providing the kind of thermal sink that a power plant uh, of medium size is going to require. 
Now, the sites are not suitable for amenity purposes. They are fundamentally uh, large scale factories and we've never had a practice of uh, people coming in and out uh, through tourism or indeed for amenity purposes. And they are heavily interconnected to uh, existing important national infrastructure. So ESB Networks, which is effectively is a separate company to ESB Generation and Trading, uh, has power station, has uh, substations on the site. And those substations provide access to the national grid and connecting to the national grid provides the option of either uh, importing or exporting power, but also uh, in providing services. And this is a thing that we only relatively recently have started to speak about because the introduction of large scale renewable energy in the form of wind power, or solar power, has been a transformation in terms of how we use, how we source our energy and, and changing our dependence on carbon rich fuels. But they suffer the disadvantage that they, they inherently don't have some of the services that just came naturally for free with thermal power plants like the plants in Shannon Bridge and like the plants in, uh, in, in Lanesboro. So our ambition for the sites is to develop them, use and harness the infrastructure that's there, don't turn our back on it because that would be a waste, it costs huge amounts of money to develop that infrastructure, but use them in a way that helps ESB's overall ambition for the country in terms of decarbonizing, not simply the electricity networks, but decarbonizing the way we use energy in transport in, and in heating, as well as uh, in the generation of electricity itself. So they're the, the, the factors that, that influenced how we think about, we're going to reuse the, the sites. I want to explain a couple of things about the sites because in discussions that I've had with people, it's clear that not everybody understands just what are the sites there. So here's a picture, this is a composite picture. Uh, it's showing both the new power station and the old power station. I'm saying new power station, it's, it's 15, 16 years old at this stage, but in power station terms, it's relatively young. The old power station is shown there with the stripy chimney. In fact, that, that doesn't exist anymore. So all of that looks like it's the uh, power station's site because all of it, to some extent, is being used currently or had been used up to the end of, of 2020 in the production of power. But if I show you a map of the site here, you'll see there are areas shaded into, in different colors. And the area here that's in yellow is the part which actually belongs to ESB generation and trading and can be reused. Parts of it uh, of the site aren't going to be reused for a significant number of years because they are uh, currently um, holding uh, old legacy ash from the old power plants as well as from the, the, the new power plants and redevelopment of those parts will come at a later stage. So this part here, sorry, there's my X for reference, this part here that I've shaded in, in uh, uh, outlined in red, that's the area that we're looking to redevelop and to redevelop it as a renewable energy services center. I'm highlighting one little piece that's here out on the side, which is called the Dalton Center. And this actually is a piece of infrastructure that was built for the original Shannon Bridge station. It was used for storing and, and mixing uh, peat and, and generating kind of different grades of, of peat. Currently, that is an archives office. It's an archives facility that ESP has been using for our own internal um, uh, historical purposes. We, we keep old, uh, old, old power plant components in there. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in a little while, but before I do that, let me ask, answer another question that uh, comes, which is why don't you reuse the existing buildings? So uh, because this question has come up so much, I'm just going to show you a couple of slides explaining why. This is a side view of uh, one of the stations. I'm not sure whether this is uh, Lanes or, or Shannon Bridge. Um, and it looks like a very impressive building. And people have asked if they could use offices and workshops and so on that are in that. If you strip away the, the cladding around that building, what you would see, and I'm using an animation, uh, what you would see is that in fact, these, stage, these uh, power plants are not power plants inside a building. They are simply um, a wrapping around a power plant. So there's no, there's no brick walls here. There's, there's nothing of any structural integrity here that could stand alone by itself. There are steel girders that hold up power plant and they will all have to be taken away because it's unsafe to keep a power plant unused and, and freestanding. Um, we, we've seen it in other areas where, where that can lead to uh, adverse consequences. I won't go into that. 
Um, within that building, yes, we do have some small offices and, and workshops, but they are literally sitting on the beams of the, of, of the industrial complex itself. So reusing the building, we've, we've, we've looked at all sorts of options. We've got external com uh, consultants to assist us in this, and we've come to the conclusion it's a poor use of the existing infrastructure on site to try and reuse the building. But the infrastructure on site is what we really want to keep and how then do we utilize that? So we're looking at replacing this, this quite tall building with a number of smaller installations. I've shown here just an example of two. I showed them for size. Unfortunately, we don't see people standing beside them, which is just, that's my mistake. Um, on the one hand, on the left-hand side there, you'll see what are, are battery energy storage systems. Uh, and on the other side, on the right-hand side, we see, you see a thing called a synchronous compensator, which looks quite similar to the generator that's already in the station, but it is uh, functionally a little bit different. So these kinds of installations provide the option of us to use the existing infrastructure to enhance the grid at that point, providing storage, providing inertia, which is a, an important uh, electrical capability that a grid needs to have. That in itself means that local industry and, and commercial establishments and indeed residential areas receive a higher quality of electricity but um, importantly also, it, it provides the opportunity for us to allow further penetration of renewable energy services. So uh, you've seen uh, uh, sorry, Port of Mona talking about the installation of wind farms. One of the ways of making wind farms more, effectively, more effective is if you can balance them with a service centre here. So that's the plan for the, the, the site itself, which is, as I say, is actually much smaller than you might realize. Um, here, maybe giving a bit of size to it, you'll see this, the size of those installations. It's not particularly important. Um, the next steps for us, uh, before I talk about the Dalton Center, is we are preparing planning applications to remediate the sites, to make them ready to install these uh, renewable support technologies. And when, when we have that uh, remediation uh, completed, which we're aiming to have it done by the end of next year, we'll be able to bid the site in, in the form of uh, into auctions that are run by Airgrid to develop um, these, these energy support uh, systems, the, these, these battery storage, these, this inertia. There's a small amount of employment that comes out of it. I won't pretend that it's anything like on the scale of the numbers of people that would have been employed in the power station. The power station employed 32, 35 uh, people uh, directly, as well as a number of uh, contractors indirectly. The, the services type installations that we would look to install have a much lower uh, re resourcing requirement. I mentioned the Dalton Center. This is a photograph of it here. Um, and what we're proposing to do, we've had discussions with, with Offaly County Council to say, look, we can take our materials out of this and we can make the Dalton Centre available because this is something which, which doesn't form part of our plan. It's a quite a tough, robust building uh, and could be something that's useful to communities to use for, uh, to help with community startup schemes. So we are in the discussions with uh, Offaly County Council and we are going through what is a somewhat complicated uh, series of procedures in order to um, make that, that building available to the county council and for them then to, to, to use that as part of their uh, community enterprise support schemes. So that's really all I have uh, in relation to that. I, I won't keep the, the questions up. I think you're going to be talking about the questions later. So that's, that's me. Thank you very much for that, Donal. Uh, that a clarification there, which I think would be really useful um, to, to people in the area. So that is the information from, from the big three. Um, as I said already, we will send you a summary of their main points as well as contact details um, over the next couple of days. Um, now, though, I want to move on to the final two organisations we thought would be really helpful to hear from today. The first is Fulcher Ireland. Fulcher Ireland provides huge support to those who are running tours and ventures. They collate consumer and buyer insights, deliver mentoring, business supports and training programs and generally help tourism businesses innovate and grow. Today, though, Fulcher Ireland's representative, Derek Dolan, is going to outline a particular offering which we and he believe will be of great interest to you, their new Community Tourism Toolkit. So I think it sounds like just the job and I'll pass over to Derek to tell you all about it. 
Thanks, Minister Hackett. Um, just bear with me one second and I'm going to share my slides. Yeah, uh, thank you, Minister Hackett and, and the team as well for just the opportunity to present uh, to you today. As Minister said, my name is Derek Dolan. I'm a regional manager uh, with uh, Ireland's Ancient East team within Fallout Ireland, but I've, I've worked across the country on destination and business development in, in various sectors of tourism. I'm from Tullamore. Uh, I'm in lovely, warm, clammy Tullamore today. Uh, so very familiar with the Midlands and the opportunities and challenges we have in developing uh, tourism and, and experiences in, in the region. Uh, I've only 10 minutes, so I'll briefly cover the role, very briefly cover the role of Fall Charred and before getting into details of our, our new community tourism toolkit. Full details on the work we do in Fall Charred Ireland across destination development, product development, enterprise supports, and that includes marketing, sales, can be all found through our corporate website, which is fallshireland.ie. So a little bit about uh, just what we are and who we are in Fall Ireland. Our mission is to support the survival and drive the recovery of the sector, which is the tourism sector, to maximise sustainable economic, environmental, cultural and social contributions to, of tourism to Ireland. The vision is to lead the development of a tourism industry that's on its way to making an even bigger and more sustainable contribution to Ireland's economy environment, environment, society and culture than it did in 2019. And 2019 was a record year for tourism. But of course, as you know, the, the hospitality and tourism industry has been the worst affected by the COVID restrictions uh, and has posed huge challenges for us as we try to uh, flex the work that we do to respond to the real challenges around, you know, completely losing our international visitation and being heavily dependent on uh, restrained uh, domestic market as well. So our priorities at the moment, just to give you some context, are very much around the support of this uh, survival of key tourism businesses and, and, and key strategic businesses. And we do this through uh, lots of various different ways from tourism business continuity schemes to a number of other funding streams for funding streams. So as I said, we don't own any land, uh, for Falls Ireland don't. Uh, so what we, we depend on other agencies and businesses uh, to develop uh, tourism products. Um, and how we support that is through capital investment schemes. So with private companies, we have uh, large capital investment schemes, but we also work through strategic partnerships with the major state landowners and, and some of them here today as Quilchar, but also with the National Parks and Wildlife Service, the OPW, Waterways Ireland and local authorities as well. And one of the examples that uh, Ger spoke about there as well was uh, the Sleep Bloom mountain bike trails, which was done uh, in, in partnership with Quilchar uh, and we also have Leash and Offaly County Councils on board with funding partners here as well. So Quilch are delivering an absolutely amazing product in the Sheep Bloom. These trails and supporting facilities will absolutely be world class and will really help to sustain many businesses across the region, in the, in the locality in the region, uh, as well as jobs in the localities as well. So um, if you haven't had a chance, uh, if you're into biking, some of the trails are open now, but the wider trail network and, and trailheads are, are, are coming downstream as well. And, Look, we've had bikers um, out and experience them, and we can testify that there, there's nowhere else in the world going to be like this. So we have something that we can really stand over uh, in the Midlands there as well. But with that in mind, I'm going to focus on how you enable your projects to be successful through our soon-to-be-launched Community Tourism Toolkit. This toolkit can help any tourism group, or community tourism group, if you're looking for a step-by-step -step process to um, the business of setting up a new initiative. It's also a really good resource if you have uh, an existing one that you want to consolidate and grow again uh, after the pandemic and also, you know, re re revitalizing them as well. So look, it's going to provide the context around um, starting a new project and that can be anything from a visitor attraction to a festival to community cafes that are mentioned to developing walking trails. You can all draw on various sections of the document to help establish a kind of a practical a useful business plan to set up appropriate governance structures. And I was kind of very struck by what Jerry said as well. He mentioned uh, very correctly about the passion of a lot of local community groups as well, but that really has to be matched by, you know, the organisational skills, uh, the expertise to be able to deliver these projects and make them become sustainable as well. So passion has to be matched with that expertise and we hope to be able to uh, support you to do that. So look, the objectives of the toolkit, it's, it's, it's really a post-COVID resource as well. It's to help improve operations, improve commercial performance. And we talk about commercial performance. Sometimes, you know, when people are talking about community, don't think it's important, but it is really important. It's not about making profit. It's about having sustainable businesses. It's also re reducing that resilience on funding support in terms of maintenance as well. And I know that was another factor, reducing the burden on the state and the burden on the volunteers and the people who operate these businesses. Uh, phase one was an understanding of the economic value of community tourism. 
So we did a mapping of community-based tourism projects across the Ireland's ancient East region. Then in phase two, we took a deep dive analysis, really looked into detail of six of the best available projects to try and garner the learning approach. And then in phase three was the development of, of, of the toolkit itself. In the mapping of those 50 year projects across the region, we looked at the various types and structures of businesses that were there, community groups. We looked at the social and the economic value, marketing, the innovation and, and partnerships that they have, the challenges and the gaps, and then the opportunities, opportunities that they present. Some of the baseline findings in phase one, uh, from those 50 year projects we looked at, uh, 1 million plus visitors annually. So that's a direct and indirect value uh, across them of 31.2 million into the community. Our baseline mapping showed that these projects support 190 full-time equivalent jobs in rural areas, um, 167 full-time jobs and 246 part-time, 987 volunteers actively support these community tourism projects. And they rely on a various number of schemes to support those roles, everything from public to CE to all the various ones out there. In terms of the deep dive into the, uh, uh, the six tourism projects, we, we, we did an assessment of best practice um, in those community-based projects, looking at what are the key factors that have driven their success, um, the opportunities to drive scale and, and their performance, and then identify the transferable learning so that we can take them to industry and, and, and groups like you as well, take them on board and help you uh, uh, develop your projects. Some of the projects we looked at in the deep dive, or all of the projects we looked at in the deep dive, uh, these are all relatively successful attractions or trails or a combination of both. And as I said, they were chosen to identify those key su su success factors that have allowed them to flourish uh, and to take those learnings from them. Lullymore Heritage Park um, in, in, in Discovery Park in County Kildare, Glen of Aharlow Walking Trails in Tipperary, Castle Comer, Adventure at Discovery Park uh, in just outside Kilkenny, Blackwater Eco Trails in Waterford, Cookhead Lighthouse Experience and Our Lady's uh, Island Pilgrim Experience in Wexford. Uh, so they were the six that we took a real deep analysis of, of, of what made them so, so, so very successful. And the findings from them, five of them were revenue generating, uh, 546,000 visitors annually, 9 million in direct and indirect value, and 85 to full-time equivalent jobs. So the key learnings for them, and I think this is really important that, that, that put forward to the toolkit, very good governments and business planning. So getting the right people, the right expertise, the right skill set uh, to drive the project forward in terms of business planning. Very good financial management as well. So not just on, on you know, uh, in, in those setting up, you know, uh, commercial or revenue generating, experience, but if you're drawing down funding, if you're looking at maintenance, good financial management is absolutely critical. They've engaged with Falls Ireland, so trying to understand their customers, but also to build that business acumen to the, the Falls Ireland support as well to, to have success. So the toolkit itself um, focuses on, it, it's really a one-stop resource uh, for community tourism projects. It's to provide a framework, as I said, and the guiding principles to be more commercially focused and a key resort, uh, support in recovering from uh, uh, post-COVID as well. The image that you'll see there on the screen is actually Rockcrohan in uh, County Roscommon uh, in, in the uh, Hidden Heartlands. And uh, Rockcrohan, if you're familiar, it's one of the royal sites we have uh, Tara, in, uh, in County Mead and Leinster, but Rockbottom is the Connacht seat of the High Kings there as well. So it's a, a really amazing landscape. It tells a story of going back into times of the first millennium around the great assemblies that would have been held there where the Plague Games, races, you know, uh, inaugurations of the High Kings. But that is run by a community tourism group centre there as well. So they have a very important role in you know, filling the, the experience gap in Ireland and, and telling the story of local communities and the importance of some of these sites as well. So the Community Tourism Toolkit is to assist groups who want to start up a new community tourism business, require a framework to revitalize, need assistance on attracting new visitors, especially, and build on access and grow revenue streams as well. This is what it looks like on our, on our website, and it's on the front page of our website, a link to it. And within the toolkit itself, it has, you know, it breaks into the detail of what is uh, community tourism, how to set up for success, understanding your visitors, uh, packaging your offer, connecting with potential visitors, how we recovered. There's some excellent case studies from the six we looked at there as well, but also uh, some key resources and financial templates in there for groups to use as well. So it's very user friendly. It's got a lot of practical recommendations to drive sustainability, uh, innovation, and growth as well. I'm just going to delve into just a couple of those areas, give you a, a flavor of some of the content very quickly. So getting set up for success, which is key. So if you've got a really good uh, idea, 
how can you make it into a project, manage change, get the right people and mechanisms involved to make the project work. So that talks about the structure and the governance. Who are the people you need to get involved? The planning, the vision of what you want to do and getting your objectives right to get you on the right road with the project. Encouraging involvement and finding the right people is, is, is critically important. Improving your expertise and being able to deliver trail. All the regulations, the stuff we've been told today from the various partners, getting your head around that. Uh, monitoring your progress as well, and then that aim to self-sustain. Understanding visitors is, is absolutely crucial. So whether you're into trail development, whether you're a festival, a cafe, it doesn't really matter. You need to know what your markets are. Are they families? Are they culturally curious? Are they social energizers who want to go out on, on mountain bike trails? Um, it's really important that you know your visitors and, and how you attract them. What are they looking for? What are their motivations? What are their needs? And how can you then uh, develop an experience that caters to that? So rather than have interpretation that is just for you know culturally people who just want to find out about you know, the technical details of the history of a site, if you want families out there, how do you engage them in in, in ways that tells a story about your community or your region or your site in, in a different way. So the toolkit resources and templates in it, as I said, the best practice case studies, the financial templates linked to our business hubs, with all the training programs and types of training programs that can be made available to you, uh, experience development, which is a crucial part of the tourism industry, and then some information on the potential funding streams for the projects as well. And I just draw your eye to the, to the sticky note on, on the slide there. And this was, Anne Waters from um, Hook Tourism, which is a community tourism project. Uh, and they took over the running of um, the, the Hookhead Lighthouse down on the peninsula there, which is now a fantastic uh, visitor attraction. And what she says, I wish I had this 10 years ago to hand it to my board. So at the very outside of the project, what we're trying to do here is help you navigate the pitfalls to a, success, a successful project. It took them years to get up and running. And what we want to do now is just to give you the advice, the tips and the guidance to be able to set up, you know, very effective projects at an early stage as well. So to get access to the, to the toolkit, we'll be launching it officially later this month, but the toolkit is live on our website at the moment. That's a very long winded link at the top of the page there. But if you log on to fallsherland.ie, there is a link to it on the front page and you'll see the community tourism toolkit is at the bottom there, a PDF document, 68 pages of really, really practical information. Um, I, I, I would also say that, you know, if you need to contact me, I'm going to leave you the uh, phone number here uh, on our Fall Ireland website, and I'm happy to take questions afterward. I hope you found it useful, um, and uh, best of luck. Uh, many thanks, Derek, for that, um, uh, for, for your presentation. So we're nearly at the end of our presentations and we are really at the bottom line now. So I'm talking about funding, I'm talking about business planning, and I'm talking about how to make it happen. There's an abundance of supports out there available for clubs, for communities, for individuals um, who want to see their dreams come true. But sometimes it can be hard to navigate or know where to look for help. But I think always going local is the first, best place to start. And that's why we've asked Orla Martin of the local enterprise office to tell us um, what's available and how you can get your hands on some of that information. So over to you, Orla. Thank you very much, Minister Hackett. And good afternoon, everybody. Just going to prepare my screen here. So um, my name is Orla Martin. I'm head of enterprise in the Leo Offaly, the local enterprise office Offaly, and there are local enterprise offices all around the country. So for this afternoon, I'm going to speak briefly on the following um, business startups and expansions and how to make it happen. I'm going to touch on get, the importance of getting the fundamentals right, advice and funding supports, top tips, local supports, and where to find out more. So this has been referenced, I think, by all of our speakers beforehand, the importance of preparation. The preparation is key for success and credibility when you're going to speak to stakeholders like Board Namona, Quilcha, ESB, or Fulcher Ireland, or if you're going to the bank, or your local enterprise office. But we can help on, on all of that. So we encourage people to spend time and resources on the earlier pre-start space. So this includes things like idea evaluation. You know, we'll all come along to a nice um, place and see a fantastic busy coffee truck um, and, and thinking, oh my gosh, I'd love to do that. But unless you know the detail and you do the research of um, that, you know, business opportunity, you know, you may 
you may set off and they're you know on, on a wrong footing and not be able to have your business survive so it's all about evaluating the idea where am I looking to to have a food truck? What you know? Where would be the market for it? Who would come to it? Um, the costs in setting up and running it, etc. Business research that is about reaching out and looking at examples locally, but also maybe regionally or internationally. Business planning that's taking into account every aspect: the capital investment that might be required, any planning permits, the marketing the costs of um, if you require staff, how you're going to manage that. A little bit is also very important to assess, spend some time assessing your own skills and appetite for risk, because, you know, we're all different and we all have different strengths. So it's important, you know, as you embark on a business or a community enterprise, that you take time to, to look at this, to look at your business structure, what's the most appropriate structure for your business. And into that, I'd also add the governance that was talked about there by Derek. It's so important if you're running a community type business that you take the time that everyone around the table is very clear what the objectives are and what the scope of the business or social enterprise should be. And then obviously finance, how are you going to fund it? What funding is available for your business? And um, to one of the tips I would always give to people is that you reach out early and you find out what funding streams are available and what aspects might be covered of, you know, what your proposed investment. Now, we have information on all of the above on our website. So I've marked it there in the bottom, localenterprise.ie forward slash Offaly. And on the tab on the home page, publications and resources, it's a drop down tab. You'll see a lot of business downloads of with an idea generation um, kind of questionnaire. You'll see sample business plans. You'll see information on um, every aspect of setting up and growing a business and also what business links um, that might be important for the type of business you're looking to set up. Um, you can, we also, through the local enterprise office, would run a load of training courses and events to assist on this. So definitely, this is one of my key messages for today. Preparation is key for success and credibility. I'd like to look at three different business types and just with a very quick overview of the supports that might be available. So firstly, part-time startups. So this is for you great idea, a great way to pilot a new business idea. It might be that you're interested in, in organizing um, photography classes out in the peatlands. You might be wanting to make some jewelry. You might be wanting to set up um, a weekend cafe, you know, food truck type thing. So this is a way, a part-time startup is a great way to pilot a business idea. It will hopefully generate additional revenue for you and it will help you develop your hobby into a business. So supports we have available for that through the local enterprise office will be information and assistance on idea generation, business planning and mentoring. We have panels of mentors and these are business specialists that cover a range of different um, areas such as finance and marketing and HR, but also things like design, um, areas like social media marketing and um, food technology, all of these areas that can help bring a business along and develop onto the next level. We also have a course we run regularly, a four evening um, course covering the financial and legal obligations of having a part-time business, how to manage tax, how to tell the boss, how to manage your time and resources. And like it truly is incredible with our smartphones, the amount of business we can conduct um, on free apps and uh, low cost offerings through our phone. So we can also assist with microfinance loan funding, anything from two and a half thousand euros to 25,000 euros. And then protocol partner initiatives, the local enterprise offices link in with a number of different agencies. So Borbia, Falcha Ireland, Enterprise Ireland, Intrio, Revenue and Design and Craft Council of Ireland and so on. So depending on the theme of your business, we should be able to put you in touch with a partner agency that may have relevant training, funding or other support initiatives to assist you with your business. Social enterprises. So these community enterprises or social enterprises are community run. 
They can be businesses or services. Um, they can lead to local job creation and community enhancement. And again, I suppose this echoes a lot of what Derek was speaking about earlier um, in terms of Forge Ireland and the community run businesses. And what's really important about these, I think as well, is that they, um, they make a, a town or a village or an area more vibrant and more busy, and that can act as a catalyst for other people to set up businesses in the area. So it's really important for, you know, for communities and for, especially for smaller maybe towns and villages. So the support's available as before, all that support, the initial and idea generation, business planning and mentoring is available. For community enterprises, it tends to be more our colleagues and friends in the local development company, the leader groups. So they tend to deal more with community enterprises. So for community social enterprises, there may be funding uh, towards things like signage, toilet facilities, capital investment. There might be collaboration opportunities, and I just wanted to draw your attention to one. Um, in West Offaly, there's the Peatland Communities Project, which is a number of communities in the west part of the county that have received funding from the Just Transition Fund to develop social enterprises in around Peatlands. There's also Rethink Ireland, the Social Enterprise Fund. There are, there's loan funding from the likes of Plan Credo and Community um, Finance Ireland. So, but for more information for social enterprises, I'd recommend you get in touch with your local development company or leader group. For private enterprises, so these are privately owned, they could be um, sole traders or limited companies generally, the businesses or services create job creation and have the added benefit of the salary spend of the community. So again, all that initial pre-startup um, pre and, and growing kind of um, expansion related supports are available. Also, we have a range of, like, of training courses that are available to, to all people looking at setting up businesses and management development training for people who are looking to grow a business and manage staff, learn to delegate and probably explore new markets. With lots of different funding schemes available and it's interesting you'll see there we have towards feasibility startup and expansion but also ones that are very um, popular at the moment we have a new one green for micro which is for businesses that employ up to 10 people and it involves two days free consultancy of a green specialist who'd help come in and give advice and guidance on how you can make your business more sustainable, which may involve you, um, you know, re reducing energy consumption, reducing water consumption, re-looking at the materials you're using, the packaging you're using, and, um, and, and a range of other areas. So you're left then with a report and then, you, you know, I suppose guidance on how you can implement th those, um, those recommendations. The Lean for Micro is another similar project to help businesses become more efficient. And all these things are critical in the light in light of obviously the climate, climate, um, climate change, Brexit, post-COVID. Um, so there's lots of businesses to help, lots of opportunities and supports, excuse me, to help people become more um, efficient. Trading online vouchers is where people can get funding of two and a half thousand euros to sell online. There's microfinance loan funding, as mentioned earlier. And again, the protocol initiatives are, can be very important there. And we encourage people to speak initially, certainly, to the local enterprise office. And then we'll advise on the relevant supports and which agency to approach. And then now some top tips. And these are for everybody. I would suggest you engage with your local Leo, who then, as I say, probably give you information on who then to, to contact you know, who's most relevant for your business. The advice to work on and not just in your business is, is very easy. Um, it, it said the, working with a business is, is so time consuming. So it's very easy to just get stuck into the operational aspects of opening up in the morning, um, dealing with queries and dealing with sales, dispatch, getting money in. But if at all possible to work in time to reflect Make sure what you're doing is adding value, is making money for you, and to look maybe at ways of improving efficiencies. Do attend events and training initiatives. 
to network with other businesses and community groups, seek re regular updates as different initiatives come and go, say yes to speaking opportunities, case studies, trade show representation and interviews. We all know that sometimes opportunities come disguised as hard work, but they are good if you can make the time to do that, as you know, it can lead to marketing of you know your business and good PR for your business. And then tip two, to be green and sustainable. We see that it's so important and to position your business to avail of future green funding schemes. So to be very mindful of the, the green issue as increasingly consumers are demanding it of businesses that they um, use sustainable packaging and have a, you know, a green approach. Access local supports. So for example, in Offaly, we've um, three co-working hubs the Junction, Ehive and Stream Bar, and there people can rent hot desks and work. So it may be something that you might consider um, that would be useful for you to even rent a hot desk a day or two a week as you're planning your business. And that way you're connecting and interacting with other business owners and you're, you're learning as you go. See what local authority initiatives are taking place in your area. Like all the local authorities are very, very heavily involved in developing the greenways and placemaking and public, uh, you know, improving the public realm, the centre of towns and, and villages. There are tourism initiatives, there are cultural initiatives running, heritage forums and opportunities. Um, there's climate action groups within the county councils. Um, a lot of them are working on diaspora initiatives and various elements of economic development. And by keeping an eye on social media and connecting even directly with the relevant departments and the local authorities, you may find out of opportunities to either promote your business or to get involved in an initiative um, to test, test something. So also to engage with local and regional networks, the Chambers of Commerce, BNI, the Local Development Group, etc., and sector specific um, initiatives as well. There are tourism groups, food and drink groups, um, craft um, networks, um, engineering networks, where there's a very popular and very strong one in the Midlands called the Ingenuity network and it's all engineering companies about 56 engineering companies and they are working very well together to develop and innovate and um, everyone is benefiting from it so take a look and see what what's available in your area and to be mindful of the just transition projects and funding so this can be either just the recently funded um, projects there may be opportunities to connect and engage with those and then there should be future funding opportunities and to be prepared for them so the local enterprise offices I'm finishing off with this slide because we're the one-stop shop for anyone starting or growing a business. So we're the place you can come to to find out which agency you should be speaking with. Um, we'll be able to help you for a certain amount of the way and then perhaps we'll you know, direct you on to colleagues. So there's a network of 31 of us funded by Enterprise Ireland and based in the local authorities in the county council buildings. And we're your business connection to all state agencies that can help start and grow your business. I'm finishing off with our website address there, localenterprise.ie. The email, I suggest you email um, if you're in if you're in Offaly, but even if you're not, you can email us info at, at leo.offalycoco.ie. And if you can put land use webinar in the subject line, that'd be great. And we'll deal with any queries then. So thank you. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Orla. Oops, again, there's such an abundance of information there. Um, and look, that brings our presentations to an end. Um, they have been recorded, so don't worry if you missed anything. And if you have any further inquiries, um, here are the email addresses um, of the organisations who presented. So please get in touch with them. Thank you.